so many years of my life, I just wanted to be the same as everybody else. Why? Because if you could listen into my thoughts, you would have heard things like, if people know that I'm different, they may not like me. They may not want to be my friend or they may not include me. The fear, I suppose, of not fitting in and being the odd one out. So for the first 18 years of my life, I did everything I could to make sure people didn't know that I had anything different. Fortunately though, the outcome some 17 years after that, I went to three Paralympic Games and won three gold medals. The best thing about doing that was realising that it is absolutely fantastic to be different. That's the best outcome of my whole journey. Realising that the world is such a better place when we're all different. And not only is it great to be different, but that wonderful things can happen to me, both professionally and personally throughout my career. I must admit though, it took me over 30 years to realise that. And I know you're probably sitting there a little bit puzzled because I don't look a day over 21, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it took me a long time to realise that it is wonderful to be different. So what I want to do today is share my story briefly with you and take you along that journey and explain why I'm different. But I thought before I start, I really want to say that it is wonderful to be here. As you saw from some of that footage uh, where I actually got beaten, um, that was in the Sydney Games. It is great to be back in Sydney. I'm from Adelaide. Uh, but it is wonderful to be here and can I thank Seat Alliance for bringing me along to the Social Inc. launch. <coughs> I must admit the last few days reading about the program, getting a bit of an insight and watching some of the videos that you're about to see today, I am so impressed, so excited about the program being launched and I really want to tell you why throughout my presentation. So for the people that don't know me, which is probably most of you because I am from Adelaide, some people know me in Adelaide, but if, I, if you're here from Sydney you probably have no idea what is wrong with me. Hands up who's been trying to work out why I said I was different, I'm a Paralympic athlete, who's been trying to work out what's wrong with me? It's probably been most of you and that's okay. <laughs> I love the fact of doing that now because I think as people, having a difference, if you've got to celebrate it, you've got to try and challenge people as well. And so the reason why I'm different is because I have a mild case of cerebral palsy. And when I found out what I had was cerebral palsy, my parents started to receive phone calls from their friends. And their friends were saying, I'm so sorry to hear about Katrina. Because at the time, they'd read in the paper, and it was in the Sydney Morning Herald, in fact, that star netballer had cerebral palsy. And I think they were sorry because they really didn't understand what it was. Maybe their image of cerebral palsy, probably more for the adults in the room, of older people in the room is Steady Eddie. Can you all remember Steady Eddie? Uh, or maybe their image was more severe cerebral palsy. And as many of you would know, being CP Alliance, uh, there are many different types and severities of cerebral palsy. I happen to have a mild case, um, and I'll show you how it affects me a bit later. But I think the interesting thing with cerebral palsy is, even with the advancement of medical technology and how good we are in Australia, every 15 hours a baby is born with cerebral palsy. So a little bit about my background. I was born in 1977, so you having to use your brains at all. I'm 36 years of age, as of last Wednesday. And uh, I spoke to my mum about her pregnancy and she said everything was right on track. She wasn't sick, she didn't have an accident. The only thing that wasn't planned was me. In fact, my mum was breastfeeding with my five-month-old sister and uh, then she found out that she was pregnant. So uh, <laughs> for people that... Uh, might not know breastfeeding isn't a great contraception, um, but uh, so she was a, uh, I was a surprise, and I probably can say right now for the people that can't see, if I just do a bit of a side on turn and hold my shirt, <laughs> you might see there's a little baby growing in there. I'm actually 25 weeks pregnant with my third boy, uh, so a little bit. <laughs> Thanks, Natasha. <laughs> Uh, a bit more planned, I've got a five-year-old, a three-year-old, <laughs> not like my mum who only had uh, 14 months between us. So, But mum said everything was perfectly fine, I uh, couldn't think of anything that um, happened. I was born on time, I was a good weight, I was a good height as a baby, and as a baby I did everything babies do. I sat when I was supposed to, rolled when I was supposed to. The only thing they probably noticed initially was that I didn't crawl. I was a snake and laid on my tummy and really 
bed with my left side, which is my non-sleeping side. But I walked at 14 months, so I was sort of fitting in. It was around this age, though, it's around two, though, my, my grandmother noticed that I was limping on my right side. And this is where they first started to go and get a few investigations done, and we went and saw a doctor, and he had a look, and really reluctant to diagnose anything, but just said, keep an eye on it, if it doesn't get any better, then come back and see me. Another year went by, and I was still limping on my right side, so I went off and saw a paediatric specialist. And it was the year of 1980 when this happened, and uh, you know, it's so exciting that we're up talking about disability today, and we have social ink, because even think back, I know, for the adults in the room, back into the 80s, you know, this wouldn't even been happening. People didn't even want to talk about disability. And, and my parents went and saw this specialist and he, he had a good look at me and he told my parents at that point in time that somewhere during my mother's pregnancy I'd suffered some very mild brain damage on the left side of my brain and that's why I was limping on the right side of my body. Uh, he then sent my parents away with a little night plaster and I'll just get the girls to bring up the next slide. And here's a shot of me probably as a... I reckon I could be about three or four in that photo. And I had to wear this plaster to bed. So the doctor said uh, she'll need to put this plaster on her foot to keep her ankle at 90 degrees at night to make sure that her calf muscle doesn't tighten up. So that was the only real thing that the doctor sort of gave me physically to do, besides a whole bunch of stretches, which I'm sure other people with CP in the room or other disabilities have a sick of doing their stretches and their exercises. Um, and, but that's all he said, but he said to me I'd have to wear that plaster uh, to bed every night until I got through my major growing years. And I'm pretty tall up here, um, probably about six, one with my shoes on today. Uh, but it was around 3,000 nights, 72,000 hours, 4,320,000 minutes and 256,260,000 seconds. But, you know, you see I wasn't counting or <laughs> didn't really mind wearing this plaster. In fact, I hated it. You know, ever since I can remember having to wear this plaster, absolutely hated it. You know, it's not a nice thing to take to bed with you. No one else of my friends had to wear one. And so I made this pact with my parents that they were never to tell anybody that I had an eye plaster because it made me different and I didn't like it. So if a friend would come to stay at hide it somewhere where I knew that if we played hide and seek that no one would find it under the bed because that's where it was usually kept. I would just make sure no one knew. In fact, my dad sent me this picture only a few months ago and said, Kat, you might want to use this one for your presentation. So I went, oh, great, Dad, thanks. And we had to scan it in because we didn't have digital cameras back then. But if I'd found that during my years before, probably before I was 18, what do you think I would have done with it? I would have ripped it up, burnt it, and didn't want anybody to see it. So I'm really glad that I didn't find that one because I just hated the fact of having to wear that plaster. So I'd have to go visit the physio about three or four times a year to get a new plaster made. I'd visit this doctor a couple of times a year just to make sure everything was going okay. The term cerebral palsy was never, ever, ever mentioned to my parents. They just thought that my right side was a bit weaker than my left. And they knew that I'd suffered some damage during the pregnancy. But as a young kid, I was always good at my schoolwork. I always was prepared to do extra work and was always at the top of my class. And I was also very good at sport. And if you look at my family genes, my dad played Aussie Rules football in South Australia for a team called North Adelaide in the 70s and won a couple of premierships and actually beat Carlton in 72 to become the Australian premiers. And that was way before AFL was even existing. And it's great to see the Sydney Swans are a part of this program as well. But my mum's, um, yeah, I've got a Sydney Swans fan. <laughs> Give me the fist there, is that right? <laughs> Uh, my mum's um, niece or my first cousin played basketball for Australia for three Olympics and she's really tall, an incredible basketballer called Rachel Spawn. So when you've got good sporting genes from both sides of your family, that's helpful, particularly when you've got a mild weakness or disability on one side. So growing up for me, I could fit in to school because I could do sport and I was okay at my schoolwork. But it was around those years, early teen years though, where I started to realise how this was affecting me. And I reckon they're those years um, in early high school or even late primary school where people come in and do certain tests on kids to look for different things. And I remember the moment clearly where I realised that I could just move my right toes but I couldn't curl them over. And I could remember looking at my left side going, how can I do it so easy on my left side and I cannot even, I can just move my right toes. 
And I remember going and telling my parents, I said, Mum and Dad, why can't I do this? And they didn't, actually didn't know. They're like, come on, just try really hard, you'll be able to do it. And I said, I can't. I just can't. And it was a moment for them where they realised, if, if there's parents in the room, I'm sure when your babies have popped out, you haven't looked to see whether they kill their toes over, have you? I mean, when my first one came out, I looked and went, yes, it can kill his toes. <laughs> the next one, yes. <laughs> it's something I look for, but killing toes is not something that you probably look for when a baby is born. Um, but my parents sort of realised, okay, well, that's, that's something you can't do. And not being able to curl your toes over has some impacts. Uh, I can't wear high heels at all, I can't wear thongs very well. But the main thing is I don't have balance. I can give you a demo. So if I give you a demo on my left side, without my anyway, so my balance is good on my left side, which probably is like most of you if you're non-disabled. But if I have to balance on my right, I can't even look. That's really quite tricky. And to even think about doing a calf raise, which is this move, I can't even look. I carry another six or seven kilos as <laughs> well. Um, but it's just those movements I realised I couldn't do. But the thing that bothered me the most as a young teen is because those muscles don't work as well, my right leg is thinner. And you probably wouldn't notice if I walked around, but now I've told you, if you watch me later on, you'll see that my right leg is a bit thinner than my left. And that's the thing I hated the most because I thought people will be able to see that. So at school, my, my mind would say to me, as I said earlier, if people know that there's something wrong with me, they might not like me. So I'm going to work so hard to make sure people don't see that I'm different. So from a physical point of view, I loved playing a game called netball and was always okay at it. But I didn't train once a week like everybody else. I went out and trained three or four times because I had to get to a basic level before everyone else is already at. And then I could work on top of that and I realised, oh, if I actually put a bit more work in, I can actually be just as good as my peers. In fact, I can be a little bit better than them. So I'd worked my way up through netball and state netball. And in 1995, I found myself living in Canberra on an Australian Institute of Sport netball scholarship, which was pretty exciting. I was one of 12 girls chosen from around Australia to live there for a whole year. It was all paid for to play the sport of netball. So able-bodied sport. I lived next door to Michael Klim, some of you remember, the, the swimmer. Uh, some of you might remember Cadell Evans, who's more recent, obviously won Tour de France. He was there as a mountain bike scholarship holder. It was a great place as an 18-year-old to be living at the Australian Institute of Sport. And I know there's some people here that love sport. Uh, imagine getting to do that. Now, this was the year that my life completely changed. I got a really bad knee injury on my right side. And probably because I don't have any shock absorption and increased court time, I just got a really bad knee injury. And I started not getting picked for the team. And that was probably the hardest thing because I wasn't 100% physically able. No matter how much work I did, I could never fix it. And netball being a very subjective sport where the coach picks you if she likes you or he likes you, I started not getting picked. And that was devastating as an 18-year-old to realise that even if I worked the hardest I could, it wasn't going to change the fact that I couldn't change the way my body was built. I couldn't change what I had. But the most interesting thing happened was that my physio actually diagnosed this weakness as cerebral palsy. Because I was getting a lot of treatment there for my knee injury, my physio just talked about it like it was something that she assumed I had. She, one day she was introducing me to someone, she said, this is Katrina Webb, tick, she's a netballer, tick, she's a goal defender, tick. She's got a knee injury and went on to explain it to you. And then she said, oh, and she's really unique. She's actually got a mild case of CP. And I remember lying back in the bed going, hang on a second, I think you've got the wrong checklist. <laughs> that last one's not quite me. I've never heard that before. And I told her what I've told you all, that I knew I had something wrong. But I never knew that it was called that. A label got put on me in a sense. So for me, I was still the same person. Nothing had happened, but very quickly the word got around the Institute of Sport that there was a girl who was supposed to be non-disabled, who had a mild disability. And as you can imagine, the coaches of athletes with a disability got really excited. <laughs> because they thought, wow, how's this girl got this far in able body for non-disabled sport? Imagine if, if she's eligible and she could be good enough for the Paralympics, she could be awesome. So one day I was walking along to netball training with a couple of other netballers, and the coach of athletes with a disability at the time was a man called Chris Nunn. He used to be married to Glenis Nunn, who won Olympic gold, and 
he's a really passionate, if anyone knows him, he's just full of beans and he doesn't sit still and he just kind of jumped out of nowhere this particular day and goes, oh, Katrina, we've found out. He was so excited and pumped up. He goes, we've found out you've got cerebral palsy. You know, he's rubbing his hands together. <laughs> it was like I'd won the lottery or something. And as soon as he said that term, I got a bit scared because no one had ever said that I had cerebral palsy before. And this is back in 1995. And I didn't really know what it was. And I didn't really like the term. And I was saying, like, don't say that too loud because I haven't told anybody yet. And I didn't really know what to think. But he said to me, in a year's time, if you get classified, so they do these certain tests on me, so they classify me for Paralympic sport. I'll get you to do one. Pop your hands out in front of you. And just gradually turn your hands over. Slowly. So your palms face up and down. Now speed it up. It's a good one just to wake you up a bit. And just go a bit faster now. Faster, 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 so they do these tests on me and they tick the box to say that I'm a I could be in the Paralympics because just because you've got a disability doesn't mean you can go to the Paralympics. There's a certain group of disabilities and then even in those group of disabilities you've got to tick a few boxes. And then I had to qualify, just like if you wanted to go to the Olympics or to go to horse riding championships, Natasha, or to uh, sailing. Philip, I know you're a sailing champ, aren't you? You have to qualify. So, you know, I had to qualify. Um, and that could, he said to me, well, in a year's time, if you did that, you could go to the Atlanta Paralympic Games. Now, do you reckon I was excited and pumped up like I'd won the lottery? Uh, Why not? Well done. And Natasha answered, she said, no, I wasn't because you didn't want to be labelled. And you're exactly right. And why? Because my head told me that if I got labelled, people might not like me. You know, I might not fit in. And that's what I was really frightened about. And they were my own thoughts. It wasn't anybody else saying that. It was just what my own head was telling me. Because that's what I thought it had to be like everybody else. Luckily for me, though, there was just this small part that I thought, why is this coach so excited about this Paralympic sport? He didn't have a disability. His kids weren't disabled. I don't even think he knew of anyone before. But he was a good athlete. He just saw it as sport. And he saw it as an opportunity for people to be their best. Why does he love it so much? And when I actually sat down and thought about it, I thought, well, I could represent my country. Who'd like to do that? That's a pretty cool thing. I could potentially win medals. Who'd like to win a medal? That's a pretty cool thing. Who'd like to travel all around the world? Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Who likes challenges? Yes, me. And what was that one? Depends on what, good point. <laughs> but do you know what the thing that really motivated me was I asked myself a question. And I said, why am I so embarrassed about myself? Why do I have to hide this thing? It was taking up so much energy to hide it. Why? And I thought, if I become a Paralympian, I can't hide anymore. People are going to know. I'm going to have to learn to tell them, and I'm going to have to explain it, and that's going to help me. But what about young kids like me? Because there's lots of kids with mild CP. I've never tried to represent any other type of disability except myself. If I thought, if there's kids like me, that don't have the sporting genes that I have and if they trip over a bit more in school or people notice their disability and they get teased and they don't think they're good at anything and they haven't got any role models. You know, this was a time when the Paralympics wasn't really known. I didn't even know anyone with a disability that I aspired to back then. There wasn't programs like social media. People didn't want to talk about it. So I just thought, you know what, I'm going to go for this because my netball career is not looking good anyway. I've got this terrible knee injury, but I'm going to go for this because what a reward could it be if I get to win and be a great athlete, but I could actually learn to love myself and then I could help others. So just to, to sort of cut my story right to the end, I, I did that. Uh, some 17 years later, I, I went to three Paralympic Games. Here's uh, the footage of me in Athens, and if you press it again, there's my gold medal that I won. So I won three gold, I won two of my first games. I lost gold for eight years and I had to learn to get right back up to a gold medal level, which was a hard journey. You know, you still got to try and be the best in the world and still got to be get the best out of yourself. But do you know the, um, the best part of the Paralympic Games was actually meeting other athletes? And if you bring the next photo up, this is somebody that I got to meet in London. 
and he's called the armless archer, um, pretty obvious why. He's actually got small little arms that you can just see, sort of a shoulder and a little tiny arm. Um, his name's Matt Stoosman and he inspired me, not because he's an incredible athlete, but when I met him and talked to him, he said to me, I have three boys and I'm about to have my third boy. And he said to me, only a few months before the London Paralympic Games did his oldest son actually realise that his dad didn't have any arms. And that really inspired me because I thought, wow, this guy, it's very obvious to all of us. Yeah, he said, I just do everything with my feet. My kids don't know any different. My toes are my hands. I've done thumb, thumb wrestling with them. I just wrestle with my big toe, he said. <laughs> and I just thought, wow, what a great story of um, just to inspire people. But to say well, his parents that originally birthed him, adopted him, didn't want him. And a beautiful family put him out, uh, took him on board. They never changed a thing in the house because they were about to. And they thought, well, if we change, modify our house, as soon as he goes out the door, he's not going to be included into anything in life. And it was just a beautiful story of uh, what he's learned and now he's teaching his three kids. But I learned from lots of Paralympic athletes that when you go to a Games to be there, you have to have a disability and you've got to be a good athlete. But you don't hear about people walking around, whinging, carrying their negative baggage, going, poor me, this is how I was born, or this is the accident I had. They've actually gone, well, this is what I've got. I can't do anything with it. This is my body. I can't change it. But what I can do is be the best with what I've got, and that's what makes an absolute difference. And that really helped me to deal with my own disability. And I think the Paralympics has been instrumental in helping get people with a disability known out there. Atlanta, the first games I went to, was terrible, terribly organised. We were in a massive stadium, and it looked like there might have been 5,000 people there if we were lucky, and it looked like there was one person in the stadium. And that was my first introduction. <coughs> people just didn't care. America didn't care about people with a disability. They're still, they're still a long way behind. In fact, they didn't send one broadcaster to the London Paralympic Games. Yet you would have seen the footage from London. Do you know it was sold out? I, I was there working for the International Paralympic Committee. I couldn't get one ticket. It was a sellout. And not because people felt sorry for people with disability. People paid to be there. And that's something really special. But I think, though, the biggest uh, award, and I must say, it has been wonderful to be a part of these games and to win medals. And, you know, who'd like to be the best in the world at something? Pop your hands up who'd love to be the best in the world. Whatever it is. I don't care if it was Sudoku or whether it was anything. But it's a pretty cool thing if you could be the best in the world at anything. But the best reward out of my whole journey has been this has been learning to love my disability, has been to not hide anymore, to be the true me. I learned how to work with my own thoughts, so they were not holding me back. I learned that others can benefit from my journey and the stuff that I've got to share. I learned that we all have gifts to give. We all want to make a difference. We all have dreams and are entitled to all of that, no matter where you're born, colour of your skin, your age, your size, your wealth, even down to your own hair colour. And most importantly, whether or not you have a disability, whether it's mild, moderate or severe. In 2006, I had an amazing honour, and if we bring the next shot up, um, to go and speak at the United Nations to talk about this, to talk to the whole world about how, why and how it is really important to make sure that we include people. 2005 was the year of sport for the United Nations and uh, this was the ceremony to wrap the year up. And they were using sport to promote peace, development, education and health around the world. And they chose four athletes and who can spot one athlete in that picture that they might know besides me? Who's got good eyes? Roger Federer, yeah, he's on my left. Can you see he's trying to check me out? She <laughs> 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 thought he got away with it, didn't he? But no. <laughs> um, but that was an incredible moment through the journey and the stuff that I've learned that I got asked to go and speak at this ceremony and one of four athletes around the world. And my job was to talk to the world to say, when you, when you put your sport plans together, don't ever forget people with a disability. Make sure you include people with a disability in that plan. Because as we know, the benefits are absolutely amazing. 
CP Alliance, I would love to congratulate you on the launch of Social Inclusion today. If you haven't yet seen it all, but it's coming up and it's fantastic. I'm just really jealous that I live in South Australia and this is a New South Wales program. I'm going to make sure we get it, make it a national program and we get it in my son's school in, in South Australia because it's absolutely fabulous. I think as individuals, whatever your background, whatever you've got that is different, you know, we need to take responsibility to say that it's okay and, and find what your point of difference and find, find the thing that you, you could find is holding you back or that you're hiding could become the next best thing that works for you. We need to take responsibility for that ourselves. And when we learn to be our true selves, we can then help others. But we can't just do it alone. We need programs like Social Inc. as an example to help us. And I'm really excited to see what it's going to do. As we all know, the value of inclusion makes a world a better place, more beautiful, more interesting, more productive and happier. Good luck, Social Inc. And uh, I can't wait to see the program in action. Thank you.